All right, Donald, you done having your little emotional episode over there? Screw you, man. I'm fine. Let's keep things going. We're not technically done with the season one episodes. Next up is the 400 days stories. Starting in chronological order, we begin two days into the apocalypse with Vince's story. We join Vince while he's in the middle of smoking some dude for messing with his brother. Vince goes on the run and we see him pass by the Everett Pharmacy, so this must take place in Macon. When Vince stops, he can hide the gun in the trash, throw it down a storm drain, or just keep it on him. Doesn't matter what you do, we'll cut to Vince being taken to prison on a bus. Here, Vince will get to conversate with a few fellow convicts. Justin, a guy who's going to jail for a little white-collar crime, and Danny, a guy convicted of sexual assault, the victim of which was implied to be underage. Throw him under the jail. While you're bullshitting with Justin and Danny, a couple of the boys up front decide they would rather start killing each other now. One of the cops comes to the back to break it up, and let's just say he does a very effective job at stopping the fight. Danny attempts to stand up to this reckless cop, and for a brief second, you can see him start to second guess his decision to stand up to the guy wielding the pump action and has demonstrated he's more than willing to use it. Not that it mattered. The prisoner who was choked to death reanimates and takes a bite out of the cop immediately. Bruh, why did the driver run out on foot and leave a perfectly good bus behind? All he had to do was just kill the walker guy. Vince gets the gun from underneath the dead cop and takes the prisoner out. But then a bunch of walkers pile into the bus and now we're faced with a choice. In order to escape, Vince must shoot through the cuff of either Justin or Danny, and by extension, shoot their foot off. If you shoot Danny's foot off, Vince and Justin will escape the bus. And it's only in this timeline that Vince will choose to join Tavia in the journey to Carver's community at Howe's. On the flip side, if you shoot Justin's foot off, Danny, and Vince will escape, but Vince will not join Tavia. Following Vince's story are the events of Wyatt's. We jump right into a car chase here 41 days into the apocalypse. After shooting the truck, it'll pull away from us and the boys here ride along into the forest to hide. Wyatt and Eddie have a decent back and forth in the dialogue. Eddie starts rambling about some girl whose dad took her to a circus, and for some reason it ends with some guy who was buck naked peeing on her dad. Before we have time to comment, Eddie will crash into someone and hold up. That's not just any random NPC. That is the cop who was driving the bus in Vince's story. Yep, all of the stories in the 400 Days DLC are connected and reference the ones that came earlier in the timeline. Admittedly, a nice touch from Telltale here, despite these episodes all being filler. Well, at least we know Eddie did actually hit a guy, and that we didn't waste time playing rock, paper, scissors to determine who's going to go out and check on him. If Eddie loses the game, he'll go out and check on the guy they hit. And in the meantime, the guy in the truck catches up and attacks Wyatt, forcing you with little option but to abandon Eddie. On the flip side, if Wyatt goes out, he'll see Clyde and can try to carry him back to the car or leave him for dead. Either way, the truck will come back and Eddie will abandon Wyatt instead. Wyatt will only join Tavia if he stays in the car, or if you have Tavia say that Wyatt may find someone he's looking for at Howe's, meaning he's looking for Eddie. Next on the list is Russell, taking place 184 days into the apocalypse. We join our boy trying to make his way to Statesboro where his grandma lives. It doesn't take long for some guy to start pulling up. And you can have Russell either stand his ground or hide in the grass. If Russell jumps into the grass, you'll be met with a familiar face. The corpse of either Doug or Carly will be here left behind after Lily killed them. I'm sure you've noticed, but this truck is the one that was chasing after Wyatt and Eddie, and we see here they picked a fight with one crazy guy, a fella named Nate. Against all better judgment, Russell gets into the car with Nate hoping for a ride to his grandma's. Nate is my kind of guy, trying to fish for the important stuff, like if Russ has any tail back home. Donald, word of advice, tail was out of date when Telltale wrote this game back in 2013. It's virtually archaic in 2023. Don't ever say it again. While the boys are driving, Nate tries to get Russell to raid a female walker. Eh, six out of 10, I guess. And this is why you don't get into cars with strangers. After our liaison with the walker, we stop at a gas station and start getting shot at. And for once, it looks like Nate is going to be a team player. He almost makes you think he isn't a complete nutcase. Aside from the first run, Nate and Russell do work as a team, covering each other so they can flank around to the side of the building and get the drop on the person shooting at them. When we get inside, our assailants are just an old couple who Nate seems to have a history with. Did that old guy just refer to Russell as a spook? That slur gotta be older than he is. The old guy begs us to leave and Russell has two choices. He can either stay with Nate or get away from this crazy fucker as soon as possible. As for getting Russell to join with Tavia, it's pretty difficult and has nothing to do with your final decision. 
Russ will only go if you have Tavia say that the group of survivors will find people they're looking for. Russell will come hoping to find his grandma. Next up, 220 days into the apocalypse, we join up with Bonnie and Leland in the rain having a little would you rather conversation. Speaking of which, would you rather have lobster claws for hands or a snake for a tongue? That's a dumb question, Joe. Lobster claws is the obvious answer. Barack, I expected better out of you. Snake for a tongue is far superior. Yeah, all right, Orochimaru. Leland points out that you don't have full control of the snake. So have fun with a fully sentient creature getting in the way of running your mouth. After a short bit, Leland's wife Dee will show up and- Dee's nuts. Don't you dare Dee's nuts me again. Dee will show up and suddenly a bunch of tension will start sparking when it's clear that Bonnie and Leland like doing a lot more than talking about lobsters. Leland and Dee start arguing, which is promptly interrupted by a chase scene during which Bonnie gets shot. How kind of Dee to stop Leland from coming to help Bonnie. Anyway, we make our run down into some cornfields and play hide and seek from the people chasing us. Soon Bonnie will hide behind a tractor and when someone starts slowly approaching, Bonnie will fold them with a piece of rebar and it's Dee, oops. Dee and Bonnie have a short conversation which ends with Bonnie being called a junkie. And then Leland shows up and finds his wife dead. Depending on the conversation, Leland will either run with Bonnie or stay behind with D and presumably be executed. Bonnie is the only survivor here guaranteed to go with Tavia, which is a given since she's the only one who has a prominent role in season two. Yeah, as a resident fuck up. And with that, the final story of 400 days is Shell and Becca starting 236 days in the apocalypse. We join a small community at the gas station Russell and Nate were at during the end of their story. There's a bunch of familiar faces. Vernon's people are here. Apparently things didn't work out with the boat they stole from us. That motherfucker stole our boat and didn't even manage to get anything done with it. He's lucky he died off screen. Roman's group has a pretty good setup. Vegetables, walkers being used as watchdogs, and even some music. However, the group's peace is disrupted when some guy breaks in and tries to steal our supplies, and now we have to decide what to do with this guy. Let him go with a little food or kill him now. Now, I'm fine with letting him go. What I'm not cool with is giving them any supplies, bro. Better just get lost. Shell will end up being the swing vote here. If you kill this guy, Roman will take him out, but all the happy fun time stuff is done as the group is apparently unable to cope with the reality of their situation. If you let him go, this guy will come back with some of his friends and they'll end up killing Boyd in the attack. As you might expect, no one is particularly happy about any of this. Least of all, Stephanie, who ends up trying to escape with a bunch of seeds, medicine, and ammunition about three weeks later. Now we're faced with another situation where we need to kill someone. Shell is given a chance to go back and get her gun and to let Becca know what's happening. However, there's another choice. Take the keys and haul ass. Something Becca seems to protest against. If you do go back to kill Stephanie, Shell and Becca won't be willing to leave with Tavia unless you tell them there are people of all ages in the community. If you do run from the pit stop, they'll follow her. And that's the end of the story. We'll pull away and see Tavia, who has been tracking down survivors to bring to a community up north. She meets with the group and offers them all places in the community. Depending on your choices, the survivors will follow Tavia and we'll see them in short cameos in season two. Overall, this DLC is pretty decent. The worst of the bunch is probably Shell and Becca. Pretty uninteresting premise and no action or comedy. At least Wyatt and Russell have some comedic moments in their stories. And as much as I don't like Bonnie, her episode is the only one that actually counts for anything going forward. Overall, I think the 400 Days episodes average out to mid-tier. There's some good, bad, and a lot of stuff in the middle. Now we continue on to rank the season two episodes. First up is All That Remains. We meet back up with Clementine a few months after the end of season one. She found Omid and Krista and now the happy trio are scouting out a gas station. Krista and Omid stupidly leave Clementine alone to do God knows what in that restroom. That's three strikes, you're out of my book. One, they're bumping uglies when no one has bathed in who knows how long. Two, they're doing it in an abandoned gas station bathroom, which is trashy behavior even in normal times. And finally, three, Krista is pregnant. Lee would not approve of them leaving the nine-year-old to enter the bathroom alone unsupervised. And rightfully so, after a short time in the restroom, a girl named Michelle corners Clementine and starts going through her things at gunpoint. Damn, the apocalypse wasn't kind to your wife, Barack. Very funny, Donald. I bet you were up all night thinking of that one. The girl starts demanding Clementine's signature hat, and then Omid comes in to try to sneak the gun. 
Unfortunately, the door closes behind him and Michelle shoots him in the chest. Well, we had to know things wouldn't remain all happy-go-lucky for long. Then Big Mama Krista pulls up with rifle in hand and she just gut checks the fuck out of Michelle without hesitation. That's the kind of energy we need. Well, that's the beginning of season two, and you might as well get used to this. Because it's nothing but five episodes of shit going wrong for one reason or another. We jump ahead 16 months, Clementine is 11 years old, and like all preteens, she's completely fucking depressed. You'll note there's no baby with Krista and Clem, and while we're never told exactly what happened, I think we can all make an educated guess. It bears repeating that despite all the hardships they faced, Krista still got Clementine this far all on her own. Kenny and Lee get a lot of points for caring for Clem, but Krista is right behind them. Right now, their goal is to get to Wellington, a community for survivors up north. After a bit of time trying to cook this, what is that animal anyway? Looks like some kind of rabbit. Looks like it was rabbit season after all. Not to stomp all over your joke, Joe, but it's actually a weasel. Right, anyway, we hear some yelling out in the distance and find that Krista has been surrounded by some bandits. You can either sneak away or try to distract the scavengers by throwing a rock at them. And I gotta give Clem some points for her pinpoint accuracy. As always, your choice doesn't matter. One of the scavengers will begin chasing Clem through the forests. I do hate to deliver bad news, but we do hear something that sounds like Krista getting knocked over and then a gunshot that follows. So, she dead. Bullshit, I won't believe it. Her status is unknown on the wiki page. Hope is still out there for Krista. Clementine makes her daring escape from the bandit, who's looking pretty pathetic, getting out run by a small child. Couldn't be me. Well, this sure sucks. Now we're cold, alone, sad as hell, and we didn't even get to eat that weasel. Wait, things are looking up. We found a good old boy. It's Sam the dog. A good old boy? More like a good old meal. Jesus Christ, Barry, it's a dog. They go on calling them man's best friend. Well, there's no better friend than one that feeds you. Barack, you're out of line for this one, and this is coming from me. Well, look, we found a can of beans to eat with our new doggo. Isn't that just swell? Things are looking up for Clementine now. I'm sure things will go well with our new friend. Oh, so when I want to take a bite out of the pup, I'm the bad guy. But when the dog does it, it's, oh, he didn't know any better. Jesus Christ, so we've lost all our shit, our only adult guardian. And now Clementine is going to be afraid of dogs the rest of her life. Give the girl a break, Telltale. Sam may have attacked, but the picture of him we find with his family shows he was once a good pup who simply gave in to hunger. Now Clem carries on alone, without eating, might I add, into the wilderness, even more traumatized than she was before. It doesn't take long for her to get boxed in by some walkers, and this would have surely been the end of her story if two gentlemen hadn't shown up to save the day. Of course, it doesn't take long for even this to go wrong. Luke here drops Clementine upon seeing her wound, believing it to be a walker bite. Clementine convinces Pete to not leave her behind, and she passes out. And when Clem wakes up, well, look at that. There's the barrel of a fucking gun aimed at her. And the dumbass holding it almost puts a hole in Clem's stomach because his trigger discipline is awful. Clementine can't catch a break. I dare say she's better off alone instead of with these people known as the cabin group. Really great introduction to these people. It's no wonder almost everyone hated them when this game came out. Pretty much only Pete and Luke are worth a damn. I know we're a couple years into the apocalypse and all, but they're treating Clem like she's gonna turn up and destroy their entire community. Oh no, Clementine would never destroy a community. It's only a coincidence that every location or group of people she ends up with gets decimated shortly after arrival. After a brief examination by the doctor, he concludes that Clem's bite is, well, it could be anything. So let's lock the tired, hungry, traumatized, and injured child in the shed when it's basically winter. I hate these people. Lee didn't die for this. Obviously, Clementine doesn't take this lying down. She sneaks out of the shed late in the evening and gets to work looking for a needle, some peroxide and bandages. There's a few ways to go about getting supplies here. First, Clem can either sneak into the cabin via a trap door at the bottom, or she can get Alvin's attention after Rebecca is done yapping in his ear. If you persuade Alvin, he'll bring you some bandages for your arms and a box of apple juice. Oh, hell yeah. Alvin, my man, you're cool in my book. That apple juice finna hit, but we'll save that for later. Clem carries on inside from under the patio and can find a needle in the restroom. While you're there, Rebecca will come in, and you'll accidentally hear her let it slip that the baby she's carrying might not 
be Alvin's. And I will be putting that in my back pocket to use against her later. Once we've got the needle, you can take a bit of time to explore another room and Clementine can steal, I mean, pick up a watch. If they're going to treat Clem like she's some kind of deviant, might as well act like one. Moving on into the final room, we accidentally meet up with Sarah. Thankfully, she doesn't alert the household. With Sarah's help, we get a bottle of peroxide and head back into the shed to engage in a game of operation. This gotta be the least fun game of operation ever. What happens next is not for the squeamish. Make sure you take a hit of that apple juice before you start. Clem is gonna need it. First, Clem begins by pouring the fucking bottle of peroxide directly onto her arm. Damn it, Clem, you're supposed to take a rag and dap a little of it onto your wound. After another hit of your juice, you begin the fun part, stitching Clementine's wound. And if you thought Telltale might let you skip over this with a cutscene or fade to black or something, you're crazy. Now, nah, you're gonna sit here and suit your Clementine's dog bite all four motherfucking times. Listen, I know you all look up to me. Good joke, Donald. As I was saying, I know you all look up to me, and I know I'm a super tough guy and all, but ain't no way I'm stitching my own arm like that. Same, I guess I'm just dying. After one last sip of the juice, you bandage Clem's arm, but just then a walker comes up and attacks Clementine. After she fights it off all on her own, the group of adults finally show up to check on her, and Clem drops one of the coldest lines in the series. I'm still not bitten. Holy W, Clementine. Well, now that they're certain Clem wasn't bitten by a walker, they finally let her inside. After this long episode of terrible events, Clementine finally catches a break and gets a nice warm meal. We have a decent talk with Luke, reminiscing about the old days with Lee. Nick even came by and apologized to us. Things are finally looking up and here comes Rebecca. Time for this grown-ass, whole-ass adult woman to begin beefing with an 11-year-old girl. But what Rebecca doesn't realize is that Clementine can give as good as she gets. Whose baby is it? Excuse me? If it's not Alvin's, whose is it? You shut your fucking mouth. You should probably think about being nicer to me. Getting pressed by a kid under half your age is absolutely crazy. I'm telling you, man, these Gen Alpha kids are something fierce. Half of them can't even read. We cut to the next day, and Clem is out on a little hunt with Pete and Nick. And we learn that apparently Nick also almost gut-checked his uncle, too. Maybe we don't let this guy carry a gun around anymore. As we continue walking, we come across some guys who weren't too lucky. As we search them, we find one of them alive. And it's one of the guys that ambushed Krista in the woods. Bro's out here begging for water. Well, I'm begging to know where Krista is. Cough it up and maybe I'll give you a sip. Bro jumped a woman and a small child out in the wood. F him. Have fun looking up at us from hell. We suddenly hear Pete let out a yelp and see he's been bit on the leg. Right after that, a ton of walkers start pulling up and now we've got a choice. Either run to Pete or run to Nick. If Clem goes to Pete, Clem will help him kill a walker that attacks, and the two watch Nick haul ass. If you go to Nick, Pete will be unable to defend himself from the walkers that attack him, and he'll die right there on the spot. Naturally, Nick gets angry with you here, but in the end, you both dash away into the woods, and that's the episode. Damn, this episode felt kind of short. Not gonna lie, all that remains isn't great at all. Pretty weak start to the new season. The episode legitimately peaked in the first five minutes with the death of Omid, which was just a bit of a shock factor. And then we're separated from Krista, almost immediately after, almost like all we went through at the end of season one was pointless. We should have gotten at least half the episode with Krista. All but like two or three of our new friends annoyed the shit out of me too. In fact, I'd go as far as to say the only good thing in this episode was Clementine. I seriously wouldn't play this episode if I weren't invested in Clem's story. I do think that's the crux of the issue with this episode and a lot of season two going forward. Most of this BS doesn't matter to me. But what does matter is making Clementine happy. But we're not ranking Clem's character here, it's the episode. So I say we put the episode in bad tier. Nah, Barry, you're being too nice. Season two, episode one is straight doo-doo and belongs in the trash bin. Don't hit anywhere near as well as season one's first episode. All right, I'll concede on that and stick all that remains in the trash tier. Moving on to episode two, we have a house divided. If you went with Nick, he and Clem will end up in some shed. Nick is a useless sack of nothing. So it's up to Clementine to find a way out. He starts drinking some leftover whiskey in a jar. But that whole part is pretty depressing, and Nick isn't even the one who got bit. With Pete, you'll end up holed up in a truck. 
Pete contemplates cutting his bitten leg off, but backs out. Yeah, the last thing we need is Pete's tropical punch Kool-Aid bursting out everywhere. Thankfully for Pete, there's a pack of expired cigarettes. I'd say that shit's bad for him, but I think the walker bite will kill him first. Cutting ahead a few hours later, Pete is well and truly done for. So he resolves to distract the walkers so Clem can make a run for it. You can try to convince him to follow you, but he's too weak now, so we run off leaving him behind. Of course, the sensible guy is the first one to bite the dust. When Clementine makes it back to the cabin, she fills Rebecca and Carlos in on the events, and they go off looking for Luke and Alvin. Carlos asks us to look after his daughter. And I think it bears pointing out that Sarah is the older of the two. Anyway, when we meet her, she greets us with a photobomb. And just like that, I hate the girl. Sarah will also want you to take her picture as well. You might want to avoid doing so, but it doesn't really matter if you do. If you thought getting your picture taken without your consent was bad, wait until she pulls out a fucking gun and points it directly at Clem's face. That's twice now that someone in this group has put a gun in Clem's face, and I'm really not a fan of it. After showing Sarah how to use the gun, she'll see someone return to the cabin, and it's not someone who should be here. Naturally, it falls on the 11-year-old to handle this grown man at the door. Gotta give Clem points. She's capable of facing off with Carver with a stone-cold attitude. Sarah demonstrates that she's completely awful at hide-and-seek, and the man here catches her going into a room. We follow him up the stairs, desperately trying to cover things. It's here that the man will leave you alone if he doesn't find anything. However, if you took a picture of Sarah, he'll find it on the floor and immediately drop all pretenses and start speaking more honestly with Clem. Well, now that we're done with the stranger danger PSA, the adults finally return and we fill them in on Carver, so we have no choice but to get out of here. So the group packs their things and sets out on another journey. On the way, we'll go looking for Pete. And Rebecca apologizes for her behavior the other day. Yeah, I bet letting her know we had the juice on her scared her into being nice. We find Pete, and as we can expect, he's dead, his guts torn out, and a bullet hole in the head for some reason. Pete didn't have a gun, which means someone passed by and did this. Easy to assume it was Carver. Nick will fall into a state of depression and lag behind the group as we continue on to a five-day long journey. We come across a mountain with a ski lodge on it and decide to cross the nearby bridge to get there. But first, we need to scout things out. Now, Luke offers to go, but who do you think he's taking with him to watch his back? Perhaps any one of the other grown men? Nah, nah, he'll take the little girl into danger instead. I'll give Carlos some points here. He actually vocalizes that Clem is a child and should stay back. You can even agree with him, but Luke just says, nah, come along. I know Clementine is the player character and has to take part in everything, but this is just getting silly. After clearing some walkers, the dynamic duo run into a guy on the bridge. Things go smoothly, we talk the guy down and he offers us some food, no catch. Until this absolute buffoon Nick pulls up and trains his gun on Matthew for no goddamn reason at all. Luke plainly yells at Nick to not shoot but I guess he's hard of hearing or something. Jesus Christ, Nick might just make me a gun control advocate. Some people really aren't meant to bear arms. When we get to Matthew's shed, Clementine goes in looking for food for Becca, you know, because Alvin simply can't do that himself. We find a sick hunting knife and a can of peaches. After that, we keep moving up to the ski lodge. Clementine climbs up to the top of the tower to scout the area, and we see some lights out in the distance. But we're interrupted by a group of individuals already living in the ski lodge. And there's a familiar face. Holy shit, they didn't kill Kenny? How the hell is he alive? We saw him get boxed in by walkers. He got lucky, it's that simple. Not only that, he pulled a new girlfriend. Not bad, Kenneth. With the reunion concluded, head inside the ski lodge and finally get to engage in some nice kid tasks. No taking care of other kids older than us or trying to distract dangerous grown men. Just some fun decorating a Christmas tree and helping prepare a nice dinner of peaches and beans. Now, there's not a lot I won't eat, but peaches mixed with beans? That's unpleasant going in and even worse coming out. I mean, hey, you're getting protein and that's all that matters. When the dinner bell rings, it's time to pick a table. The cool kids or the uncool kids? I mean, easy answer is to sit with Kenny just so we can catch up with him. Doesn't matter because after a while, Luke and Nick will join us and Kenny will clue us into a place up north called Wellington that's up near Michigan. Up near Michigan must be in Ohio. Ohio? Oh, hell no. Kenny, take us back to Florida. I'd rather take my chances there. Real talk, the Great Lakes is a top tier location to be during an apocalypse. Anyway, an argument breaks out and you might as well get used to that. Walter pulls us outside to talk and we run into a woman spying on us in the window and it's Bonnie. After a brief talk, Walt gives her a box of supplies and sends her on her way. 
which even I think is a dumb idea. Back inside, we meet up with Luke, and he tells us that the guy on the bridge, Matthew, was a good friend of Walter's. And we're fucked. Clementine goes to find the knife we picked up, which belonged to Matthew, but it's too late. Walter already found it. And now Disney Man isn't all sunshine and rainbows anymore. He deduces that Nick must have killed Matthew, and it's up to Clementine to either condemn Nick and name him irredeemable, or to admit he's a good person. Nick has been screwing up way too many times. Even Ben didn't have his first screw up until the episode after he arrived. Ben at least was too big a coward to hold a gun, so he didn't kill anyone directly. After speaking with Walter, the windmill starts going crazy, and we have to shut it down. Now we have one of the dumbest instances in the game ever. For some reason, everyone turns to the 11-year-old girl to shut the windmill down. Thankfully, it wasn't really all that difficult. But walkers start pulling up anyway, and amidst the chaos, Nick gets boxed in, and this is where things with Walter come together. If you did defend Luke, Walter will save him. If you didn't, well, say goodbye to Nick. Things start looking bad, but thankfully some help arrives. Oh wait, it's Carver. Oh look, Bonnie is with them too. How kind of her to return Walt's favor. Everyone is taken into the lodge, and Carver starts demanding to know where Rebecca is, slowly breaking Carlos's fingers one by one. And once again, we've got a choice. Clementine, Alvin, and Rebecca can surrender themselves easily, but Kenny will begin taking out Carver's men. Walt will die no matter what, and Alvin will be next. If Clementine begs Kenny to stop, Alvin will survive here, but if she remains silent, Alvin will be shot dead after Kenny shoots Carver again. Next, Carver will pull Clementine or Sarita, and that's when Kenny will surrender. Alternatively, Clementine can escape out of a window and meet with Kenny, and the two of them work together to pick off Carver's men. Walter dies, and Alvin will follow him if you don't surrender. But once Carver threatens Sarita, Kenny has to give up. Luke will disappear, with Carver assuming he's finally run off. The episode ends with everyone being carried off to their new home. A House Divided was a bit of a better episode. There's some good tension if you end up alone with Pete when Clementine is faced with Carver, and the finale of the episode as Kenny tries to pick off Carver's men. And on that reuniting with Kenny was a memorable moment. Yeah, they kind of just threw that in there as more of a shock factor. Outside of Kenny returning, the episode should still go in bad tier. I don't know about that, Joe. On top of Kenny, we also get some good quality time with Luke, who proves himself to be better than the rest of the group. All of the annoyances from episode one were dialed back in episode two. And at least something happens in this damn episode. I'll give it mid-tier. I'd have liked more, but it's not totally bad. I'm with Barack on this one. If you guys like bad, you can like bad. Onward to episode three of the season, it's in harm's way. Clementine and the gang are on the move, or they would be, but Sarah had to stop for a bathroom break. This dude, Troy, then asked the two miners if everything came out all right. Just in case you weren't sure if Carver was a total piece of shit or not, He'll smack Clementine for listening to him talk if you don't apologize to him. Oh, shit, my bad, bro. I'll stop my senses from working the next time you're talking. The fuck does he think this is? A Discord call? She can't toggle deafen in real life. Inside the truck, Kenny isn't content to sit like a trapped lamb and starts cutting his binding off. Good to see growing out his beard hasn't made Kenny any wiser. The hell is his plan here? Jump out the truck and fist fight the guys carrying automatic weapons. That is quite literally the plan, Joe. Attaboy Kenny, standing on business. More like lying in a shallow grave. Thankfully, the truck knocks some sense into Kenny before he can do anything stupid. Well, everyone, welcome to Howe's Hardware. Which is located in Tennessee for those who care to know where the season is currently taking place. In Howe's, we'll pass by a few familiar faces. The playable characters from the 400 Days DLC that decided to follow Tavia will be here. As you know, Bonnie will be here no matter what. Turns out Tavia isn't the kind-hearted individual she was when we saw her last. In her defense, that was a year and some change into the apocalypse. Perhaps some things happened to harden her. The main group is locked away in a location called the Pen Grate. We had a nice warm and cozy ski lodge and now we're back in the dank cold air. In this camp, we meet Reggie, another community member who helped the cabin group escape. He didn't manage to go with him and he lost his arm to a walker or at least that's what he claimed. If you manage to keep Alvin alive, Tavia comes and takes him away. He says things will be fine, but I wouldn't bet on that personally. If Nick is alive, he'll sit down somewhere and be useless the entire episode. I'm not even sure they gave him speaking lines in this one. They probably didn't expect anyone to save him. There's a couple other survivors in the pen with us. 
Jane is sitting alone, brooding like the loser she is, and Lee 2.0 is here too. That's Mike, and I'm sure it's only a matter of time before Kenny asks him if he can pick the lock to the gate and suggests he can bash a couple heads. Moving on, it seems Kenny has caught the same virus as everyone else because now he's asking Clementine to do everything. Clem goes around looking for a way out. We have no luck, so we turn in for the night and we're rudely awakened by Troy kicking Clem in the gut. Rising up in the priority of my hit list at a rapid pace. Now it's time to get to work. We got that 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. shift and no lunch. Not before Sarah learns the consequences of talking too much. I don't want to come down too hard on Sarah, but goddamn, she must realize that this really isn't a good time to be talking. And Carver goes and makes Carlos smack the whatever Hispanic ethnicity they are out of her mouth. Moving on from this awkward situation, we go to help Bonnie load up the firearms. Huh, actually a decent task for a kid. Color me surprised. I was sure they'd make Clem go out and clear the perimeter alone or something. Bonnie tries to make amends for leading Carver back to the ski lodge, but I'm not trying to hear that, especially not after she gives us this bum-ass jacket. It doesn't look that bad, Barry. Tavia agrees that it's ugly, and I trust her taste in clothing more than Bonnie's. Our next task is in the greenhouse, simply farming, just cutting off some dead leaves and stems and saving them for composting and harvesting the berries. Shit, I'm about to boot up Stardew Valley. Hate to rain on your parade but Sarah is here too, and she's not looking too good. Reggie is the one responsible for us here, and apparently success means he might just get out of the pit. When Clem and Sarah get to work, Sarah is hesitating, and your options are to either help her or focus on your own task. For some reason, Reggie wants Clem to guide Sarah along, even though that's his job. After an awkward head pat, you make your decision, but no matter what you decide, someone's work will not be done, and Reggie will pay the price. After a brief conversation, which doesn't seem to go in Reggie's favor, Carver will shove Reggie off the roof to his death. Well, he got out of the pit like he wanted. Too soon, Donald. Clementine meets back up with Bonnie, and she tells her that Carver told Reggie to come back next fall. Come on, guys, his body is still warm. Making our way to Luke and Mike with a bucket of nails, we'll catch them fighting. Nah, Mike can't be Lee 2.0. Lee Everett wouldn't be getting pressed by Kenny like that. Walkers start attacking, and apparently neither of the big guys wanted to look out for the girl. At this point, Clementine might as well be alone. Long story short, Troy shows up and saves the day and Clementine leaves but is abducted by Luke who managed to sneak his way into the compound. We took a vehicle to house. How the hell did Luke keep up on foot? Don't worry about it. Anyway, Luke fills us in on a massive herd of walkers closing in on the area and wants Clementine to get two walkie-talkies so he can keep in touch. Next up, we pay a visit to Carver, and if he survived episode two, we'll find Alvin beaten and bruised in a chair. Carver has some BS talk about how the future generation needs to be stronger than the adults, and how his and Rebecca's kid will be raised to be strong, and yada, yada, yada. Carver pulls the we're not so different, you and I, and we return to the group to discuss our escape. Kenny suggests drawing herds to the compound and escaping in the chaos while Rebecca wants to hold out for Luke to come up with something. We decide to do both. Draw the walkers in using the PA system, get Luke a walkie-talkie so he can keep tabs on Carver's men, and we'll get through the walkers by covering ourselves in their guts. First order of business is for Clementine to sneak into the stockroom and swipe a walkie, and at least this time, this is really a task only Clem can take. Aren't those glass skylights supposed to be stupid heavy? 60 to 150 pounds. God damn, Clementine has been hitting the gym. Clementine shows us that she has 100 sneak and successfully swipes a walkie without Tavia realizing it. Well, that was easy. Next morning, the group decides to have Clementine deliver the radio to Luke even if you don't want to. When you pass by Bonnie, you can tell her that Luke is around and that she has a walkie for him. Bonnie reluctantly lets Clem go. When we get back to the comic book store to find Luke, he's gone and Troy will eventually find her in there and slap her. I'll kill him. We return to the pit and Luke went and got caught trying to find food for himself. Bro really sold at the last minute. The plan is compromised. Now Carver starts demanding the walkie talkie. Clem has it, but Kenny will cover for her and claim that he didn't know what he was thinking. But Carver definitely will not forget that. Yeah, but Kenny might, because Carver starts beating the brain matter out of him. Carver probably wouldn't have stopped if Bonnie didn't show up to warn him of a breach. Apparently, this was enough to get Bonnie to wake up, and she claims everyone will be leaving tonight. Kenny's got a pretty strong skull, it seems, as he survived Carver's beating, though it looks like his eye is completely toast. The group decides to meet up at the Parker's Run Civil War site and Clem goes off to set off the PA system. When we get to Carver's office, you'll see Alvin if you survived episode two, still out of it and covered in his own blood. 
He's beyond help, so we start setting up the PA system. Just then, Alvin gets up and pulls out a small gun from Carver's desk. Alvin's last act is to buy Clem just a bit of time by using Carver's gun to shoot a guard. If Alvin isn't there, Clem can pick up the Derringer herself, which comes in handy later. Returning to the pit, Carver has caught the group and has apparently had enough of the BS and is ready to kill everyone, including Rebecca. Clem can either jump onto his back or shoot his cheek with a handgun, creating an opening for Luke and Kenny to take Carver down. After a brief discussion on what to do with Carver, Kenny just pops the man in both his knees. Then Ken decides to pay the beating Carver gave him back with interest. Everyone else will want to leave, but Clementine has the option to sit and stay despite Sarita's attempts to save her. Two states of mind on this. Obviously, Clem is a child who shouldn't see such carnage, but at the same time, this is the world we live in now. So maybe it's time for Clem to grow up. If Carver were a man of color, it would be accurate to say Kenny literally beat the black off him. Bro's face is just gone. After the beating, we regroup to cover ourselves in Walker entrails and we're interrupted by Troy. Jane coerces him into letting his guard down just long enough to shoot his dick off, which draws the walkers to him. A fitting end. He's lucky Kenny never found out he hit Clementine. Now, as we walk out into the horde, I'm sure you're wondering. The rest of Carver's men are shooting blindly into the horde of walkers. Sure would be a shame if one of us was hit. Well, today's plot armor loser is Carlos. A stray shot catches him in the neck and walkers attack him. This causes Sarah to run off and everything falls apart, culminating in Sarita getting her wrist bitten. The final big decision is to either cut Sarita's hand off in an attempt to save her life or to kill the walker biting her. Either way, that's the end of the episode and I'm not gonna lie to you, most of this felt like filler. In Harm's Way has a lot of boring content where we kind of just go around aimlessly. No time in between. In season one, we would have been able to walk around and interact with the location and the people, like the 400 Days protagonists are here. Why can't we speak to them directly? Carver wasn't ever a particularly interesting villain, but his end here, while satisfying, seemed a bit rushed. The whole episode is him just further affirming that he's a piece of shit, as if that weren't evident. This episode is also the biggest offender of let's make Clementine do everything. And before anyone says she's the player character, Lee got more help than this. When the St. John's captured everyone, Clementine, Kenny, Lily, Carly or Doug, and Walker Mark all assist Lee in some capacity, depending on your choices. But in season two, especially in this episode, Clementine is carrying this whole team on her back. In Harm's Way barely even addresses the previous episode's events too. Nick and Alvin being alive does not matter at all. Alvin is absent most of the episode, and Nick is not a character at all. Overall, the only satisfying part of this episode was Kenny getting it back in blood against Carver. That aside, it belongs in bad tier, only a slightly more enjoyable episode than all that remains. Damn, season two is kind of weak. Picking back up where we left off, if you cut Sarita's arm off, she'll naturally start screaming out, which will attract walkers who start attacking her. Kenny fights them off, and when faced with the barely alive Sarita, he'll start lashing out at everyone, including Clementine. Kenny is frozen with shock and you can convince him to leave or you bring your hatchet down on Sarita to put her out of her misery, which Kenny will not appreciate. Alternatively, if you killed the walker, Sarita will be in shock of her bite. Kenny will show up and help her out, denying that she's really bit. They leave Clementine alone in the horde. Thankfully, it seems Rebecca is also having a hard time getting through. And with Jane's help, the trio get through the horde safely and head to Parker's run. When we get there, Bonnie and Mike are waiting. Luke and Sarah are missing. Nick, too, if he's alive, and Kenny is sitting alone or with Sarita. Talking to Kenny right now is a lost cause. So we head off with Jane to go looking for our missing members. On the way, Jane will teach Clementine some survival tactics, like her takedown technique by kicking the knee. While we're passing by, it seems the writers just decided Nick survived long enough and we encounter him as a walker stuck in a nearby fence. Again, only if he made it past episode two. We come across Sarah's glasses and then hear both her and Luke trapped in a trailer somewhere. Jane and Clementine work together to get inside and find Sarah curled up in the fetal position. The walkers start to break in, so we have to escape out of the skylight. Sarah isn't budging and it's up to Clem to either make her get up and leave or we leave her behind to be devoured. On one hand, saving Sarah is the right thing to do. But on the other hand, she's pretty much a dead girl walking the entire rest of the episode. Jane did have a point about one thing. 
You can't make someone keep going when they don't want to, especially not when they put you and the rest of the team at risk. I leave her behind. I mean, she's a determinate character. She won't be with us for much longer. Back at Parker's Run, we set out to find Rebecca pacing around and Kenny sitting in a tent, mourning Sarita. Eventually, we'll be able to talk him out so he can help Rebecca while the rest of us go out looking for supplies and shelter. With Bonnie and Mike, we go to a museum and come across two big containers of water, which I can't realistically believe no one has found. We also get a run-in with a raccoon, perfect dinner. Uh, probably a good thing they didn't catch the raccoon. The last thing we need is the zombie virus overlapping with rabies. When we catch up with Jane, we'll go to an observation deck, and while we scope it out, some guy shows up and starts dumping the contents of his bag into the trash can. Jane and Clem hold him up, and this guy reveals himself as Arvo. We can either rob the guy for all his medicine, or we can let him go, but we'll steal his gun all the same. Clementine leaves Jane alone and returns to the main group, shortly after Rebecca starts going into labor. Which, yeah, that's just what we need right now. Making it to the deck, we find Luke and Jane having an affair. It bears repeating. It's been less than 24 hours since we all got done covering ourselves in walker guts. Donald, please, I'm begging you to stop. It wouldn't be such a big problem, except Luke was supposed to be watching the perimeter instead of having five minutes of fun. Rebecca starts giving birth, so it's up to the rest of us to fend the walkers off, first by securing the gate. We try to block it with a cannon, but that causes half the deck to collapse damn near kills Jane and taking Sarah down if she's still with us. Of all the characters in the season, the one that confuses me the most is Sarah. The game made a point of telling us that we taught her how to defend herself, but nothing comes of it. Sarah does close to nothing in episode two, and in episode three, she's kind of just there to be a punching bag. She either dies in the trailer park, and if you do save her, it's just so we can see how broken she really is. You could realistically remove Sarah from this season and almost nothing impactful would change. Anyway, we cut the rest of the deck loose to stop the walkers and Rebecca finally gives birth to her son, who we'll come to know as Alvin Jr. We spend some quality time with the baby and we'll later find Jane getting ready to leave. Luke will throw a fit over this, but we have more important matters. We need to find a new location, but Rebecca doesn't seem physically capable of moving. The group heads out into the snow, and Rebecca collapses, and we leave her sitting on a tire. Just then, Arvo returns to exact revenge on us. Revenge for what? You don't necessarily have to steal from him. I think the assumption is he's coming back because Jane steals his gun, regardless of what you do with the medicine. Well, that's annoying. Well, more Russians appear and hold the group at gunpoint, and in the middle of the argument, Clementine notices Rebecca slumped over, and she then reanimates into a walker. The final choice here is to either have Clem shoot Rebecca herself or call on Kenny to do it. Either way, both groups begin shooting wildly, and that's the episode. Amid the Ruins is a bit better. At least it isn't Clementine doing literally everything all by herself anymore. Yeah, but like you said, Barry, the episode just doesn't do anything with your choices. Nick dies off screen, Sarah dies no matter what you do, and Kenny is angry with you no matter how you handled Sarita. The notable thing about this episode is giving us some alone time with Jane, which I suppose wasn't too bad, as well as introducing us to Alvin Jr., though we have no reason to care about him besides the fact that he's a baby. Another weak episode in my books, bad tier? Trash tier, it's no better than episode one. I'll give episode four a break and put it in bad tier. It builds on the connection between Jane and Clementine and shows us more of Kenny's sanity slippage which will be vital to the final confrontation in episode five. Everything else about the episode sucks, though. And now we're on the final episode of the season, no going back. We open up where we left off, and it's absolute chaos as the firefight breaks out. Mike gets faded, Bonnie is providing covering fire, Arvo is trying to save his sister while Luke and Kenny hold off two of the other Russian guys. Thankfully, Clementine is standing on business and can slide over and grab Alvin Jr. Alternatively, Luke will run out to save AJ, but get shot in the leg in the process. But that happens regardless. From here, Kenny is holding it down, saving Luke from a guy who tries to finish him, and then he takes Arvo hostage in an attempt to end the conflict. However, Arvo's sister Natasha reanimates and attacks Kenny. Clementine stops her, much to Arvo's dismay. The final Russian guy gets the drop on Kenny, but Jane returns and gives him a taste of her knife, and Kenny executes him. Alvin Jr. ain't even 24 hours out of the womb, and he's already having to survive his first shooting. He's a true American. Rebecca is dead, 
Jane rejoins us, and we take Arvo, who convinced Kenny to spare him by promising to lead the group to shelter and supplies. We continue off into the wilderness with Arvo in the lead, right up until Luke's shot leg gives out. Arvo doesn't seem to understand us, so Kenny gets rough with him to make him stop walking. I mean, Kenny is coming down on Arvo kind of hard, but I don't understand why Bonnie and Mike are so quick to defend him. Arvo's group did gank us in the middle of a snowstorm. Setting Arvo aside, we get some time to reflect on things. Luke is feeling sorry because all his friends are dead. Clem helps him come to terms with all he's lost. Then Clementine will help change the bandages around Kenny's eye. Yikes, I'm surprised that the wound didn't get infected. Can we also call attention to the fact that Kenny just carried a firefight without depth perception? After some time with Kenny, we'll carry on to an abandoned power station where the group will hold out for a night. It's here everyone gets to sit down and enjoy one last happy get together before the shit hits the fan. We learn here that it's apparently Luke's birthday, or at least close to it. He also went to school in art history. Luke got lucky thanks to the apocalypse. He won't have to worry about getting hit with those student loans. See, you guys don't need student loan forgiveness. Just wait and I'll cause a zombie apocalypse instead. We've also got a bottle of rum, which Clementine can use to lure Jane and Kenny back to the group. Jane, for once, proves she's actually pretty cool and lets Clem take a swig. Underage drinking Donald, really? Lee would be turning in his grave. Oh, please, nothing wrong with a little imbibing while supervised. Well, Kenny probably doesn't agree with you there. Though it's not like Clem really drank anything, she could barely keep a single mouthful down. Kenny will also apologize for how he treated Clem after Sarita's death, and Ken will vow to do better by AJ. Oh, and I guess it's worth pointing out that you can go talk to Arvo if you want. He's sitting in some corner somewhere, crying in the cold. Not gonna lie, I forget he's in this scene. All right, it is pretty messed up to have Arvo chained up away from the fire. Yeah, let's see you keep that opinion after what happens later. In the morning, the crew begins moving to Arvo's hideout, but we have to cross a frozen river to get to it. So the group spreads out and moves across slowly, but naturally, a bunch of walkers start following us. Not a problem. All we have to do is just not let them cross faster than us, and Luke is about to fall through the ice. Well, if Luke has been missing all his friends from the cabin group, He's about to be reunited with them. Two choices here. Do as Luke asks of you and cover him while he pulls himself out of the water, which is the right decision, might I add. Or you can do what Bonnie asks of you and try to approach Luke to pull him out of the water. If you help Luke, both he and Clementine will fall through the ice. Luke will rescue Clem from a walker that attacks her, but it drags him down into the abyss. And that's the last we see of him. Jane will show up and pull Clem out of the ice to get her to warmth as soon as possible. But that's not the important part. See, if you do the smart thing and just cover Luke, Bonnie will decide to go over and pull Luke out. Except they both go through the ice instead. Clementine can try to break the ice, which will result in her falling in any way, but Bonnie will live. However, my personal decision is to just leave it be, even if that means watching Luke drown. I liked Bonnie. She seemed like a nice woman who was trying to do better. But holy shit, what a massive screw up. Luke did not deserve to go out like that. With that, the cabin group is totally gone. When we get inside, Kenny will begin beating the hell out of Arvo for what happened on the ice, right up until Jane comes back with a bag full of supplies. Arvo was telling the truth. All right, this is the only time I'll say Arvo didn't have that coming. I'm not switching up, fuck Arvo. Sometime later, Clem will wake up and discuss things with Jane, who is mourning Luke's death. Afterward, Kenny shows up and has Clementine come help him with the truck. But there's not a lot of luck there. Kenny tells of us plans to head to Wellington while also voicing his distrust of Jane. And so begins the Kenny versus Jane setup. Back inside with Jane, we hear her side of the story. Jane argues that Kenny is falling too far off the deep end and is comparing him to Carver. I won't lie, Kenny is definitely slipping. That's nonsense. Kenny hasn't intentionally harmed anyone who didn't deserve it. It's not like he's snapping on Mike. Both parties have their points here anyway. Kenny gets the truck up and running, and now the group decides on where to go next. As already noted, Kenny wants to go to Wellington but everyone else suggests returning to Howe's hardware, suggesting that the horde of walkers has moved on. An argument begins, but everyone decides to sleep on it. In the truck, Kenny will let us know that what's driving him is keeping Alvin Jr. alive no matter the cost, and he believes Wellington is the answer. Kenny is set in his ways, so we'll have to come to an agreement sometime in the morning. But wait, it looks like Mike, Arvo, and potentially Bonnie have another idea. Any soft-heartedness I had towards Arvo has been totally eradicated. Not only are they abandoning the group, 
They're doing so with all our supplies and the truck that Kenny fixed. Okay, for real, Mike is taking all of the supplies and the only transportation. He is basically sentencing Alvin Jr. to death and possibly Clementine and the others too. And then the fucking shitbird Arvo over here decides to shoot Clem. And what do you know? It was all a dream. We've been asleep in the RV the entire time. That would be nice back to when things were a lot happier. When Clementine comes to, we're racing along in the truck. I choose to head Ken and Jane and Kenny beat their asses. But the truth is that they ran away on foot with our supplies. Hope you didn't think Jane and Kenny buried their beef. Now that Clem is awake, it's a great time for them to start arguing. This is wild. Kenny is dead set on continuing north. So when Jane doesn't get her way, what does she do? She starts provoking Kenny like a petulant child. This escalates to Kenny calling Jane out for being selfish. And then Jane starts poking at Kenny's dead family. Jane keeps piling it on and on. And things might have gotten worse if not for the cars blocking the road. When Kenny leaves to go look for some diesel, Jane floats the idea of leaving Kenny out in the snow to freeze. When some walkers show up, Kenny and Jane make a run for it. And quick question, why did Jane have Clementine drive instead of just swapping seats real quick? Because we needed the car to crash so the group could be split up in a blizzard. Now Clementine walks alone in a complete whiteout, trying to find her way to the rest area a mile away. And against all odds, she makes it. Clem made it after Kenny. And he begins freaking out when he realizes Jane is alone with AJ. Jane shows up but she's missing something pretty vital. Jane implies that AJ has died, and this causes a lot of distress in Clem, but especially in Kenny. Jane tells Clem to stay out of what happens next, and right in the queue, Kenny comes back looking to scrap. Tense moment here, Kenny and Jane face off, and there's nothing Clem can do to stop it. Eventually, Kenny will get the upper hand on Jane, and Clementine is faced with a few decisions. She can shoot Kenny here, saving Jane, at which Kenny will have one final moment telling Clem she did the right thing. Kenny will admit he failed everyone, and that despite wanting to die for so long, he's actually afraid of it, and he'll pass on. Or you can let Kenny kill Jane by looking away. If you do that, Clementine will get a second prompt to shoot Kenny. He'll simply tell her to do it, since he no longer feels he has any reason to live with AJ dead. However, if you talk to Kenny, you'll eventually hear a baby crying and find AJ in a broken down car a short distance away. And now we reach the source of the conflict. This entire ordeal was manufactured by Jane just to make Kenny snap so she could remove him from the picture. Caring not for the fact that Kenny is a useful protector and that AJ damn well could have frozen to death being alone in that car. All Jane had to do was just come back in with AJ and things might have been all right for everyone, but no, she had to prove a point about Kenny being crazy, even if it meant dying. I do like Jane, but even I'll admit her plan was dumb as hell. Now things get a bit complicated here. There are multiple endings to season two. Clementine can end up alone with AJ, which may look cool, but it doesn't make a lick of sense at all. No shot does an 11-year-old girl successfully take care of a newborn all by herself in the apocalypse. Then there's the endings with Jane. You'll go back to Howe's, which is both devoid of any walkers or survivors. A family of survivors will show up. Clementine can either advocate to let them in or send them away. Lastly, we have the endings with Kenny. It turns out Kenny was right about Wellington all along. When we arrive at the gate, we're stopped by a woman named Edith who tells us that the community is already over capacity. This prompts Kenny to beg her to let the kids in, even turning down the bag of supplies they offered. This scene is arguably even sadder than Lee's death. Clementine can be adamant about not leaving Kenny behind, but Kenny is just as stubborn. He wants the kids safe no matter what. Edith comes back and says the kids can come in, and this begins the farewell between Clem and Kenny. If you decide to go to Wellington, you'll leave Kenny behind and he'll never be seen again. Back in the day, the Kenny versus Jane debate used to be heated and very divided. But with time, people have come to understand Kenny was always right for Clem and AJ. And the conversation here is proof of it. I mean, just listen to it. Just take the kids. What? Please, just take the kids. It's too dangerous out here for them. Kenny, I- It's just a little girl and a baby boy. You can make room for that. You can take back the supplies you gave us if that helps. Please, just, I need them to be safe. And it's safe in there, I know that. Just ask someone, please. They won't make it out here, please.
I'll... I'll ask. Just give me a second. You don't need to look at me like that. This is for the best. We're not staying here without you. Yes, you are. No, we're not. Yes, you are! It's safe here. You two will be safe. That's what's important now. We can take the children, but... Just the children. I made the case that... Thank you. Thank you. Listen, okay? Listen. This is your chance. For you and this boy. I don't trust myself to keep you too safe. Not anymore. Please, I'm begging you. Please, stay here. Stay here, where it's safe. Where you two will have a chance. No, no, no! Why are you doing this? Because it's the only way. For both of you. The thing about Alvy here. Please, Clem, just do as I'm asking. This one last time. You'll meet people. You'll make friends. People better than me. Good people. That, that don't have to look at you and feel ashamed at what they put you through. Please, Clem, please. Where you won't have to sleep with a gun next to you every night. Where you can be a kid for a while. Of course, Clementine clearly picked up Kenny's stubbornness. If you refuse to stay in Wellington, Edith will drop us another bag of supplies. And so the duo and Alvin Jr. walk off into the wild, and that's the end of season two. Episode five is definitely the best and most memorable episode of the season, mainly because of the ending. The tense conflict between Kenny and Jane was enough to make me forget how mid the entire rest of the season is. We get some decent character moments in the slower moments of the episode. Hearing about Luke's past life, Jane's story of eating glass when she was trying to drink wine, and Kenny reflecting on his family. As callous as this sounds, episode five benefited from cutting out a lot of the fat. With the majority of the cabin group gone, we were finally able to get more focused writing around the small group of characters. I believe no going back should get top tier. It fails to reach the absolute peaks of season one's finale, but it's still impactful given how it affects things going into season three. This season was weak and is easily the worst of the bunch, but I can agree that the final episode was saved by its ending. I agree with Top Tier for no going back. That's all she wrote for season two. Next up, we'll look at the episode of The New Frontier and the Little Michonne spinoff. Until then, stay safe out there, drink plenty of water, get some sleep, and we'll see you on the next one.